Amen. So keep your place there in, in Revelation chapter 22. So Revelation chapter number 22 is the last chapter in the Bible. So you think about a great work, you know, the Word of God. You think about the, the Bible um, from Genesis to Revelation. And you think about, like, how, how, how do you end such a book? You know, how do you, how, how do you wrap things up? If you've ever read the Bible from beginning to end, you know, Revelation chapter 22 um, is the last chapter of the Bible. You say, how does it end? Look down at Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 18. The, one of the last things that God says, or the last thing that God says to us, the last command that he gives to us in the Bible, it, you know, it fits. It makes sense. He basically says to us in the Bible, look it down at verse number 18. At the very end, he says, For I testify, every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So it says anybody that takes away from this or adds to it, you know, he's going to be plagued with the things that are in Revelation and his name is going to be taken out of the book of life. Now, I've done a whole sermon on the book of life, but just all that to say this, um, go back and watch that if you haven't seen that. Nobody ever gets added to the book of life, okay? Everybody starts in the book of life and people are just removed. So if you're ever removed from the book of life, you know, you're blotted out, the Bible says, removed, it says, um, take away his part out of the book of life, you're not getting back in, okay? That's damnation. So what God is saying here is if you add to or you remove from my word, that covers any change, by the way. If you add to or remove, if I have a, a sentence or a, a, a phrase and I change it, I've either added to it or removed from it, one of those two things. God covers both things. The last thing he says in the Bible is, don't change what I've written. That's what God says. He's like, or you're going to go to hell. <laughs> it's basically what God is warning people here. So this morning, we're going to talk about the best-selling Bible in the world, I believe, especially the United States, the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible. This has been the best-selling Bible, um, by the way, that, that's, you're like, why do people make new Bible versions? Well, I'm going to show you the agenda behind it, but it's for the money. I mean, that's what, you know, that's the, the useful idiot level is that, you know, it sells. Okay, you have a new, you know, version of the Bible, um, it sells. People don't have their own ideas. They can't come up with a book that would sell. Let's just make a new version of the Bible. That's, what, that's the base reason. And that's not the base reason, but that's the, that's the simplest human reason right there is just for money. Okay, obviously, I'm going to show you what's behind that agenda this morning. But, you know, the NIV, you say, what's wrong with the NIV? Well, I'm going to show you this morning. See, the NIV sells itself as just being an easier to understand version of the Bible. Turn to John chapter 8 and verse 32. Because what we're told today is that, you know, you just can't read the King James Bible. It's too archaic. So really all, you know, the NIV does is it just removes the these and the thous, uh, you know, and the yees and the yous out of the Bible, because, like, that's so hard to understand for people, those four words, right? The these and the thous. Like, I'm going to explain it to you in two minutes, all right? I'm going to explain to you how to, how to recognize the these and the thous and the yees and the yous in the Bible and what the difference is and actually why it's necessary, okay, to have those words in the Bible. Look down at John chapter 8 and verse number 32. This is Jesus speaking here, and Jesus says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So here we see two um, words. We see a ye and we see a you. So here, here's all you really have to remember, okay? First of all, the the and the thou will always go together, and the ye and the you will, will always go together. Why? Because the ye's and the you's are plural, and the these and the thou's are singular. It's very simple, all right? These new versions of the Bible, they just change it all to you. They change it all to you. So, what they do is they remove information from the Bible. Because if I say, hey, you know, you should go wash my car, there's no way in a modern version of the Bible is to be able to tell if I'm talking to one person or many people. Whereas in the Bible, the King James Bible, we know that Jesus here, look back one verse where he says, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my what? My disciples. Uh, he's talking to many people. 
He's talking to many people here. And we can tell because of the yees and the yous. Now, the ye is the subject and the you is the object, which means, you know, we, you don't even need to know that. All you need to know is the ye and the yees and yous, the whys, are plural. And the these and the thous are singular. That's really complicated that I just explained to you in like two and a half minutes. But my point is this. If you remove the these and the thous and just turn it all into one word, you lose information. You get rounding errors. It's like a rounding error. If I have a number, think about this. If I have a number like 12.137, and then I round that to the nearest, you know, um, tenth. So I round it to 12.1. And then I go and I give that number 12.1 to somebody, that, that 3.7 is lost forever. That information on that 3.7 is lost forever. So if you just take the these and the thous and the yees and the yous and you turn them all into you, you have lost information in the Bible. You have literally, just from that one mistake, you have removed from God's word. But it's not complicated. It's not complicated. So why would they do it? I mean, it's, was that complicated to learn that little grammar lesson? Look, I'm an engineer. I don't know anything about grammar, and this is not hard to understand. Okay? So look, the Bible says, God is saying here, God is saying, don't change my word. The New International Version, the most popular Bible in, that, in sales in the United States for as long as I can remember, it, first of all, it, it completely deletes over a dozen verses. I think it's 16 or 7 verse, verses are just completely deleted from the Bible. They're just not there. And I'll show you one of those very important ones this morning. But it changes nearly all of them. It changes nearly all verses in the Bible. Look, we could just stop right there. We could just stop right there and we could pray. We could say that the people that came up and, you know, that, that made the NIV, that created the NIV, they're all, they're all going to burn in hell. No, they're all, they're all damned. That's what the Bible's telling us. I mean, we could just stop right there. But what I want to show you is the agenda this morning behind changing God's Word. I want to show you that these aren't just simple little, oh, you know, we're just making it easier to understand. No, the NIV is a calculated attack on the Word of God. I'm going to give you three reasons this morning, or three categories, why you should burn the NIV. And why you should warn people about the NIV. If you know people that, that you know, aren't saved, or maybe people that are saved but, are, but have an NIV, and that's what they use, you know, I want you to be able to warn people about this this morning. They're very specific attacks, and you'll see this morning that it's just not, it's not this random thing. Okay, they're very specific, and they're very subtle. And I'll talk about that at the end. The first category is this. The first category is this. So first of all, we know that the NIV changes the Word of God. All right, actually, go, go to Psalm chapter 12. Go to Psalm chapter 12 and look at verse number 6. Go to Psalm 12 and look at verse number 6. Or just look at the front of your bulletin. Look at the front of your bulletin. It's the verse of the week. The Bible says, the words of the Lord, in Psalm chapter 12 and verse number 6, the Bible says, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So the Bible here is saying that the words of the Lord are pure words, meaning they're perfect, meaning that this Bible, if, it, if this is God's word right here, it's pure. There's no mistakes in this Bible. In this Bible that was written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 different human authors, there's no mistakes. How could that be possible? The only way that it could be possible is if the Holy Spirit used those men to write this down. These, I mean, we're talking about fishermen. We're talking about tax collectors. We're talking about just laymen of all different times, kings from, you know, long ago. So, I mean, the Bible is pure, the Bible says. And then verse 7 says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So, God here is saying that my words are perfect, and I will, he's promising us that he will preserve it. Okay, so for hundreds of years, for 400 years, all we had in the English language was the King James Bible. So if you believe that in the last 50 years, all these new versions came out, and that that's really, I mean, God hid his word from us for 400 years, you don't believe Psalm 12.6. You don't believe Psalm 12.7. 
God, I guess, wasn't for those, if you were alive during those 400 years, I guess he wasn't able to preserve his words. That's, that right there is the number one argument to just have a King James Bible right there. Because God promises that he'll preserve his word and that it's perfect. Now, you can obviously, I'm going to show you this morning, you can look at all these different Bible versions and you can just find error after error after error in these versions. They don't even, they, the people that put these Bibles together, you can tell it was written by man because the Bibles contradict themselves. I'll show you that this morning as well. But the first category is this. We're talking about the NIV specifically this morning. And this is much larger, it's, it's too large of a topic to cover modern Bible versions in one sermon. So what I try to do is when we're preaching through some part of the Bible or we're preaching through something, I try to point out what false Bible versions have changed with certain verses. But this morning I want to give you a specific three reasons that the NIV is evil. All right, look at, um, go to Hebrews chapter 4. The first thing that the, that the NIV does is it attacks the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, it changes, it changes the gospel and it changes who Jesus is. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 4. Now, if you remember, in Hebrews chapter 4, we talked about Hebrews chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 in the sermon on Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So I encourage you, if you haven't listened to that sermon, go listen to that sermon. But we talked about this idea of entering into God's rest that Hebrews chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about. In Hebrews chapter 3, actually just go back to Hebrews chapter 3 real quickly and look at verse number 8. Hebrews chapter 3, we're just going to, and I was going to buy a bunch of NIV so you could all follow along in the NIV, but I couldn't get myself to either spend my money or especially not church money on like a false Bible version. So I'm just going to read you the NIV versions of this, but I want you to follow along in your King James Bible with me this morning. All right, go ahead and look at verse number 8 of Hebrews chapter 3. And let's just do a, a real quick um, review on what this idea of God's rest is in the Bible. Remember that God's rest is, is being used as a picture of salvation in Hebrews chapter 4. But in, in Hebrews chapter 3, we're comparing the wilderness, the people in the wilderness for 40 years, not being able to enter into the promised land is a picture of not being able to be saved through unbelief, okay? Because the people in Israel, they couldn't, before they would cross the Jordan River, the people, the, the spies went across and they doubted God. They doubted God's word. And they literally, the Bible says over and over again, is that they didn't, they weren't able to go into the promised land, everybody 20 years old and up, because of their unbelief, the Bible says. All right, look at verse number eight of Hebrews chapter three. It says, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saved, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said they do always err in their heart. What do you do with your heart, by the way? We're going to talk about your heart this evening, but what does your heart do? You have, where, where does your belief originate from? It, it originates from your heart. The Bible says again and again. And look at what it says. They always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. This is the picture of the nation of Israel not being able to enter into the promised land and what we compare that to in Hebrews chapter 4 as salvation. But it's interesting because look at verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart, any of you be in any of you an evil heart of what? Of unbelief. He's comparing it to not, not believing the gospel. If you look at verse number 2 of, verse, of Hebrews 4, Look what it says. It says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we, for we which have, what? Here it is again. Believed. Do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What the Bible here is saying is it's comparing the unbelief of the children of Israel to somebody who's had the gospel preached to them and does not believe. God is saying the works, the works, who, who did the works? Who did the works of the gospel? Jesus Christ did the works of the gospel. And that was the plan from the foundation of the world. Even before God created the entire world and he created us, his plan was to save us through his son, Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. 
And the only way you won't be able to enter, it's talking about the eternal rest of salvation in Hebrews chapter 3, in Hebrews chapter 4. It's just this beautiful comparison of the Old Testament. Look, they were saved in the Old Testament just as, as the same way they're saved in the New Testament. By belief. The Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 4, not to go there. But here's what the NIV says. At the, uh, first of all, it titles Hebrews chapter 4. It, it gives a title to Hebrews chapter 4, which is just adding to the Word of God. And the title is this, A Sabbath Rest for the People of God. Meaning like, it's, it, like Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about like resting on Sunday for the people of God. Okay, but let me read you Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 5 and verse number 6 from the King James Bible. Look what it says. It says, And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, talking about salvation, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of, here it is again, how many times do we have to say it? Unbelief. What's going to, why, why is any man going to go to hell? He's, he's going to go to hell. Look, every man's a sinner. But why will some sinners go to hell and some sinners not go to hell? Because of unbelief. That's why. But look what the NIV says. So we just see this again and again and again. God's rest is salvation. And why didn't the people go into the promised land? Because of unbelief. Why aren't you going to be saved? Unbelief, unbelief, belief, unbelief. This is just over and over and over. Now look at the NIV. Don't look at it. Just listen. Here's what the Bible, here's what, here's what the NIV says in verse number 5. And it says, and again, passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Verse 6. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, read along in your, in your King James Bible, and since those who formerly had the good news, that's what, that's what modern churches constantly call the gospel, by the way, the good news, okay? Proclaim to them that did not go in because of their disobedience. Whoa. That, that, like it says it changes unbelief to disobedience. What is disobedience? Disobedience, it, look, if my children are disobedient to me, you know what that means? It means they're not doing what I say they're supposed to do. You see what we did here? We just turned, we just turned the gospel into workspace salvation in one verse in the Bible. If you're disobedient, how many times have you heard that out soul winning? Believe in Jesus, but you have to be obedient. Look, peop, this is not harmless because people believe this. False prophets, false teachers are getting up and they're using this verse to attach works to salvation. Could I not, look, could I not preach that if, if it was in the Bible? But doesn't that directly contradict Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, where it says, not of works? So right away, the Bible contradicts itself. We have a problem. And here's the thing about the Bible, folks. You show me one mistake in the Bible, and it's not like, oh, there's just one mistake. You show me one mistake in the Bible, and i got a major problem. Why? Because if it's not perfect, if it's not pure, how do I know what else is wrong? If there is one mistake, look, there's many mistakes in the NIV, but if there is one mistake in the Bible, you can't trust any of it. That's what I'm saying. We found, we had, a, we had a design for an entire power plant. And it was found that um, a, few, a few of the drawings were miswired in the plant. Because the drawing was, was made incorrectly. And the electricians misinterpreted the, the drawing in these certain cases. And here's the thing, they, they tasked me with going and finding out what percentage of the wiring in the power plant was incorrect. And I, and I said, like, you know, I mean, so I went and I found out, but the point is, if I, if I know that some of it's incorrect, I have to check it all. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. If there's one mistake in the Bible, we have a problem. You can't trust any of it. Unless you can tell me where the specific mistakes are. But if the Bible, if, if God's words aren't pure, you can't trust any of it. So, but we see it's not random. It's not random. We literally just added works to salvation in Hebrews chapter 4. 
Go to Mark chapter 10, and verse 24. Look, folks, I can't give you all the examples. I can't give you all the examples where the, the NIV is, is discrediting the gospel, is discrediting our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I can't give you all the examples. I can just give you, I can just give you um, a few. Go to Mark chapter 10, look at verse number 24. Mark chapter 10, and look at verse number 24. The Bible says, so Jesus, actually, let me just uh, turn there. Let's get a little bit of context, all right? Most, most confusion in the Bible, most people that are confused by the Bible are trying to teach something false. You can usually fix that by reading a couple verses above and a couple verses below um, what they're pointing at. Um, it's pretty easy to do that. But look at chapter 10 and verse number 24. So here we have a situation where um, Jesus... Mark chapter 10, oh, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10 and verse 24. So here we have a, a situation with a rich man, okay? Mark chapter 10, look at verse number 22. So here is this, this guy, look at verse number 20, I'm sorry. Go up to verse 17. See, let's get some context, okay? I'll go up to verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Here's this, this kid that ran up to him. He's like, I want to go to heaven. How can I know that I'm going to heaven? And Jesus said unto him, why, why callest me their good? There is none good but one, that is God. A lot of people will point to that verse and say, See, Jesus didn't say he's God. He actually did say he's God right there. He's like, You just called me good, which means there's only one good that's God. He didn't rebuke him for calling him, his, him good. He just said, He's basically saying, I am God. Look at verse number 19. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. Jesus is starting to get the gospel the same way we do, by the way, here. He's trying to talk about sin. He's saying, you know, he's basically saying there's none righteous, no, not one. That's what he's trying to say to this kid. All right? Look what the kid says. He said, he answered and said to him, Master, all these I've observed from my youth. He says, he goes up to the door and he says, do you believe that you're a sinner? Do you know the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Look, you'll meet this guy. You go soul winning long enough. You'll meet the person that thinks that they've never sinned. It's this guy. I mean, I remember sitting in church, giving the gospel to somebody at Verity Baptist Church, giving the gospel to this older guy, and I didn't even get past Romans 3. Why? Because he thought he was perfect. I'm like, do you, you recognize that you're a sinner? He's like, oh, no. Oh, no. And I'm like, we're all sinners. And, he, and he, you know what he says to me? He's like, you're saying the pastor of this church is a sinner? I said, yes. Pfft. He doesn't want to come to that church anymore. <laughs> Good luck finding a church. So he couldn't even admit that he was a sinner. Jesus here is having the same problem with this kid. He's, he's saying, hey, because look, folks, there's really two ways to heaven. There's two ways to heaven. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or never sin. Like, none of us are going to be able to get to that never sin one because we, we've already sinned. All right? Nobody cannot sin. So we all need to trust on Jesus. We need him for the path. But this kid, he wouldn't admit that he sinned. He answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Now Jesus, now Jesus is God, so he can point out what his actually sins are. Sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and take up the cross and follow me. He knew that this kid was in love with money. He knew that this person loved money. He's like, you know, he's like, I, he's like I actually know what your sin is because I'm God. He's like, just sell all your stuff then. Sell all your stuff and come follow me. And look what the guy says. What they say? And he said, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Like, you love money. And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Look, he's saying it's hard for them that trust in riches, because what do you have to trust in to be saved? Believe on equals trust, folks. You have to trust in Jesus. And if you're trusting in something else, it's going to be impossible for you to get saved. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying... It's going to be hard for somebody who trusts in riches to get saved. He didn't say it's impossible for a rich person to go to heaven, but it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Because of the verse before, 
They're trusting in riches, folks. But look what the NIV does. So why was it, why did Jesus say it was hard for that man to go to heaven? It was hard for him to go to heaven because, not because of work that he had to do, but because what he was trusting in. You have to remove, look, you have to repent. Meaning, what does repent mean? It means to change your mind. You have to repent. You have to change your mind from trusting in riches, in your works, in whatever you're trusting in, in Buddha, in Muhammad, in whatever else you're trusting in, and you have to repent of that, turn from that, change your mind, and trust only on Jesus. That's it. That's why. But for somebody that's trusting in, in riches, Jesus is basically saying it's impossible if you're trusting in riches to get saved. And that's the truth. But let's look at what the, the NIV says. The NIV says in verse number 24, where the Bible says, how hard is it for them that trust in riches? Here's what the NIV says. The disciples were amazed at his, this is the NIV. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? End verse. The NIV here is saying that it's hard to enter into the kingdom of God. Look, is it hard to receive a gift? It is not hard to enter into the kingdom of God. Few will enter, but it's because they're trusting something else. It's not hard. They, they took out the trusting part. They took out the trusting in riches part of the Bible. So the NIV makes salvation, it adds works to salvation, and it makes it hard. It makes it hard to be saved. The Bible compares being saved to eating a piece of bread. The Bible compares being saved to walking through a door. Is it hard to get a gift? We'll say this at the door all the time. Is it hard to receive a gift? No, you just have to receive it. It's very easy to be saved. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So you see the NIV is literally attacking the gospel here. The NIV is attacking the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18. I'm just trying, I'm trying to show you an agenda this morning. I'm trying to show you that this isn't random. We're not talking about removing these and thous. We're changing the word of God here, folks. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 18. Look at your, your King James Bible. The Bible says, For preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I, I have those words, which are saved, underlined in my Bible. Because here's the thing, folks. You're either saved or you're not. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life, it says in John chapter 3, and verse number 36. It's, it's in a moment. And then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, it says in Ephesians chapter 1. It's in a moment. When you trust on Him, it's done just like that. You are saved or you are not saved, depending on whether you have believed or you are still in unbelief. Here's what the NIV says. Here's what the NIV, NIV says. It says, for the message of the cross... It is foolishness to those who are perishing. That, that, that's pretty close. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The NIV turns salvation into a process. How many people have you talked to, soul winners at the door, who believe that salvation is a process? Who believe that not only do you have to you know, have faith, but you have to go through this process of living this life and living for the Lord and following the commandments, they'll say. Just, look, the only way salvation is a process is if you have to work to get it. You are not being saved. You either are saved or are not saved. The NIV destroys the gospel, is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It adds works to the gospel. It makes salvation hard, it says. And it makes salvation this process that we must get through in our lives. This is works-based salvation. Like I said, we could stop here. Turn to John chapter 1. The NIV degrades the person of Christ. We're still talking about the first category of the gospel and Jesus. The NIV degrades the person of Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 3. John chapter 1 and verse number 3. John chapter 1 and verse number 3. If you look at the first part of John chapter 1, super powerful 
um, chapter in the Bible about who Jesus is. The Bible says in it just verse number one, it says in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is God. All right, and the same were in the beginning with God. The Word of God is God, and the Word of God was always there. That's what we need to understand. Now, if you look down at verse number 14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, capital W, the Word was, the Word is Jesus. Jesus is the Word, is what the Bible is saying here. The Word was made flesh, and that is Jesus. And here's something else. I mean, I just explained this to somebody yesterday. who did. They said they didn't believe the Bible. Like, well, you can't look. There's no way that you will ever run into somebody that doesn't believe the Bible and then trusts on Jesus because it's, it's impossible because the Bible is Jesus. And it's an interesting little proof because here, you know, Brother Victor is giving the gospel to these two guys and they're not believing it. And we didn't know why they weren't believing it. But it comes out when he's three quarters of the way through the gospel, it comes out, they're like, yeah, we just, we don't really believe the Bible. We believe it was just something that was written by man. But it's interesting that they didn't just believe the gospel and trust on Jesus and then not believe it. It's impossible. It will never happen. That's why I'll never get a reprobate saved. We go out and we give the gospel to everybody. You know, we don't find some, you know, effeminate guy and be like, oh, you know, he's a homo, so we're not going to give him the gospel. Because, look, lots of people are effeminate here. And they're not homos. You know, there's like, California's the most effeminate place I've ever been in my life, as far as men. But look, if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're reprobates, they're just not going to believe it. It's not like we have to worry about accidentally getting a reprobate saved. Okay, somebody doesn't believe the Bible, they can't be saved, period. Why? Because Jesus is the Bible. Jesus is the Word. Okay, now look at, and Jesus, by the way, when you see in Genesis chapter 1, how did God create the world? You just see again and again and again at the beginning of the Bible, and God said, and God said, and God said. He spoke it into existence. The Word of God actually created the world. Jesus is their creator. Look at verse number 3 of John chapter 1. Your King James Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse number 3, it says, all things were made by Him. Jesus created the world, folks. He did it Himself. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now let me read you verse number 3 from the NIV. So we see that Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus. Jesus is the Word become flesh. The Word was always there. Jesus always existed. Jesus wasn't created. He was just manifest in the flesh. He was always there. He created the entire world. John chapter 1 and verse number 3 in the NIV says this. It says, through him all things were made. It changes by him to through him. Like, you know, like it could be like in his name. Like God created it in the name of Jesus or something like this. John chapter 1, verse 10, it does the same thing. If you look at your King James Bible, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. In the NIV, it says this, He was in the world, and through the world was made, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Look, it degrades the work of Jesus. You see what they're doing? It degrades his work of creation, the, creating the world. And you know what changing the gospel does? It degrades the work of Jesus. Saying that I have to add works to my belief on Jesus, it degrades Jesus Christ. That I, oh, I got I to gotta be obedient. I got to be obedient and believe in Jesus. First of all, those are, that's a contradictory statement. I can't trust on something and then think, oh, I don't really trust it. I have to do this over here too. It's not trusting. It's not trusting. They're degrading Jesus Christ. The NIV degrades Jesus Christ. How many of you think this is an accident? It's just the these and the thous. No, this is deliberate. These are deliberate attacks. Go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Like I said, I can't show you all these. I can't show you all the attacks on Jesus Christ in the NIV. Go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Let me just read this for you real quickly for sake of time. But in the King James Bible, it says, For by him were all things created. The NIV says, For in him were all things created. Again, just degrading the work of Jesus Christ. Go to 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. The NIV attacks the Trinity. 
The NIV attacks the Trinity. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. The King James Bible, your Bible says, For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word. Who's the Word? That's Jesus. And the Holy Ghost. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And what does it say? And these three are one. We don't worship three gods. We have one God. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. One God, three persons. One God, three persons. Here's the NIV. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that testify. It's, it's literally just like removing all this information from the Word of God. Look, I'm trying to get you to understand is the NIV changes the gospel. The NIV changes who Jesus is. The NIV is trying to degrade the work of Christ. They're trying to degrade his work in the creation, and then with their attacks on the gospel, they degrade what he did for the salvation of the world. It's a big deal, and it's not on accident. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Turn to Acts chapter 8. I'm not going to get too deep into this one because we're going to talk about this in Acts chapter 8, but I want to show you a verse that's removed from the Bible that also is an attack on the gospel. So here we have a story where Philip, and we're going to talk about this story, Philip goes and he preaches the gospel to somebody who's confused. Okay, he's confused on, on who he's reading about in the Old Testament, and he doesn't know if it's talking about the Messiah. Look at verse number 35 of Acts chapter 8. It says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He preaches the gospel to this man. This is the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, there came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, this is the man who just got the gospel preached to him, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So this guy just had the gospel preached unto him. Okay? We don't know if he believed it or not at this point. He just, Philip preached unto him Jesus. He gave him the gospel just like we would give somebody the gospel at the door. And he says, here's water. I'd like to be baptized. He's like, can I be baptized? It's like, what would stop me from being baptized? And look what Philip says. And Philip said, verse 37, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know what he did there? He just confessed with his mouth. He just did Romans 10, 9 right there. He just confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shows us that he believed Jesus. He believed on Jesus. This man is saved. He's saved. So Philip is saying, you can only be baptized if you're saved, is, is what Philip is saying in verse number 37. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more. So we see a man that had the gospel preached unto him. He saw some water. He wanted to get baptized. He said, can I get baptized? And Philip says, as long as you're saved, in verse 37. And he says, I am saved. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, because that was his hang-up. He didn't know who the Messiah was. And he got baptized. All right, so baptism wasn't part of salvation. Baptism was after salvation. Okay, now let's look at the NIV. Look at verse number... 36. Oh, well, go to 35, because this is bad, too. Then Philip began, so we see in the King James Bible, it says that he preached unto him Jesus. He preached who Jesus was to him. He preached unto him Jesus. Then Philip began that, that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Like, that could be anything. He could have told him that, like, hey, Jesus, you know, just healed a blind guy. Told him the good news about Jesus, and as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand up in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. See anything missing? Verse 37 is gone from the NIV Bible. You say, what's the big deal? You say, what's the big deal? You say, what's the big deal? Because that doesn't really add baptism to salvation. But here's the big deal, folks. In 313 AD, there was this thing created called the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the false doctrines that caused them to kill millions of Christians was this idea of baptizing infants. Because the Roman Catholic Church taught that in order for your baby to go to heaven, they must be baptized. That a child that's not baptized is in danger of hell. They, the Roman Catholic Church 
added baptism to salvation. They added works to salvation. And I think it's convenient that we take away belief out of all these modern Bibles. Most modern Bibles have verse 37 removed. That's no accident. It was the answer Philip gave that said you must be saved before you're baptized. It's a big deal. So we've added works to salvation through the Catholic Church. And then, oh, by the way, oh, but the Protestants, the Protestants, they came out of the Catholic Church. They baptized babies too. I was a Protestant. They, they put it into this lump of it's a means of grace. Yeah, it's all grace, but you just have to do this work to get the grace. Look, the Martyr's Mirror, the Martyr's Mirror, this book that I bring up so much that documents literally that documents hundreds of, like, there was millions of Christians that were killed. In this book, the main reason for these Christians being killed is that they would not baptize infants. The Anabaptist was a name that the Catholic Church gave to the people that didn't show up to that meeting in 313 A.D. We are not Protestants. Protestants were protesting the Catholic Church. There's people that did not show up to that meeting. There's always been Baptists. From the time of Jesus to the time of John the Baptist, there's people that just always held to the belief of the Bible, and these people, they died for it. There's many people in this book that they would go out and they kept preaching the true gospel, and they would get someone saved. They would get a Catholic saved. And then they would go and they would have that Catholic baptized. And the Catholic Church is like they're rebaptizers. They're invalidating our baptism that they had as a baby. And they would kill them. They would hunt them. They would kill them. They would torture them. They would burn them at the stake. They would burn the person that was baptized. And they would burn the person that did it. They would burn people for having Bibles. I mean, it's, it's terrible. But this is the main reason. Because they would, not, they would not change the gospel. Which is why all these people died. And, you know, taking out verse 37, it changes the gospel. It changes the gospel. And that's why so many people died to defend it. We are not Protestants. There has always been people that have believed the gospel since Jesus. We're not protesting anything. The Protestants are Catholic light. It's diet Catholic. Martin Luther is in hell. I hate to break it to you. He did not believe the gospel. He was still very much Catholic. I call the Reformation, you know, devil's plan B. The Catholic Church was just getting too stupid. Trying to raise all these money and sell tickets to get your relatives out of, out of hell. All this stuff to raise money to build all these massive cathedrals. So, look, the main thing is that the NIV, back to the point, the main point, the first point, is that the NIV, it changes the gospel. The NIV, as Galatians chapter 1 says in verse number 8 and verse number 9, the NIV and anybody who had any part of it, and Revelation 22 matches right up with this, is accursed. Because it is another gospel. That is the most dangerous thing about the NIV. It's, it's, it's literally another gospel. Okay, go to, go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Here's the second, here's the second category. Here's the second category that the NIV does. The NIV makes the Bible incompatible with your conscience. It makes the Bible unbelievable. And if you're a soul winner, you know this too. You, you'll have people say these stupid things to you. You'll have these people say to you, oh, well, the Bible teaches, you're God, you know, the Bible teaches that if a woman is raped, then she has to marry her, her, uh, her uh, you know, perpetrator or, you know, has to marry the rapist. And you're like, what? Like, yeah, because that's what the NIV says. Yeah. NIV literally says that. I'm going to show it to you now. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 22, and look at verse number 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. So Deuteronomy chapter 22 has a lot of information on, you know, marital relations and adultery and fornication and, and all these things, and it covers, you know, uh, assault, you know, this, this, you know, rape in, in the end of the chapter. But look at verse 22 of Deuteronomy chapter 22 in your King James Bible. The Bible says, if, man be found lying, if a man be found lying with a woman, married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so thou shalt put away evil from Israel. This is talking about people that would commit adultery. Okay? And it's saying, like, that carries the death penalty in the Bible. Okay? Look at verse number 23 now. 
If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Again, this is talking about adultery as well. But it's, it's equating betrothal with marriage. Now, I'm going to explain to you when we start talking about divorce here that there's no modern-day equivalent to betrothal. But betrothal in the Old Testament and in the Bible, even in Jesus' time, even when Jesus was born with Mary, betrothal was this time when, when you were promised to be married to one another, but there was no consummation of the marriage. So you haven't, the, the couple had not physically come together yet, but they were betrothed to be married. But the Bible rules are the same for marriage. Okay, so as far as the punishments go, it's considered like adultery. If somebody who is betrothed would go and lie with someone else, have physical relationship with somebody else, it's considered adultery. Okay? Now look at verse 25. So we see all the way up to verse 22 through 24, we're talking about adultery. Two people that enter into a consensual, wicked, physical relationship. Adultery. And it's punished by death. Very serious. Look at verse 25. Now we see something different. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in a field, and the man, you must underline these two words, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. The King James Bible here is saying someone that forces that is the word that the King James Bible used for what we would call sexual assault or rape today. Someone that forces this damsel. It says, the damsel's fine, kill him. So the Bible is saying that rapists should be put to death. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel a little sin. Is that what it says? It says, no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. This is equating the sin of rape with murder. It's saying it's the same thing, is what it's saying. Now look at verse number 27. It says, for, so here's more evidence of what the King James Bible is talking about. For if you found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So here was a woman that was forced, and there was no one to save her. It's very clear what the King James Bible is talking about here. Now look at verse number 28. Look at verse number 28 in your King James Bible. The Bible says if a man find, now it's, it's another scenario. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, so this is just a single lady, just a single lady, and lay hold on her and lie with her that they be found. Notice it doesn't say force. It just says lay hold on her. And the King James Bible will use that. I mean, look, in order to have a physical relationship with someone, you must lay hold on them. You must hold them. I mean, it's just talking about people. This is a consensual thing right here again. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. This is talking about fornication. This is talking about someone that's not married, not betrothed, not married, not betrothed. They commit fornication together. The Bible is saying that man is to go and pay a, a fine to her father, and then he has to marry her. I mean, that seems to make sense. We should have more of that type of thing going on today. Yeah. Except fornication today is just no big deal today. That's another sermon in itself. Right. It's talking about fornication in verse number 28 and 29. All right? Now let's look at our NIV. Let me just read you the NIV now. You follow along in your King James Bible. So this idea that lay hold, look, just a verse ahead or two verses ahead, three verses ahead, it said force for rape and lay hold for this, this consensual relationship. And it may, look, here's the, here's the main thing. The King James Bible makes sense. When you read it, it makes sense that that should be the rule. It matches our conscience. It matches, you know, what seems to be right even to us. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. I'm going to read you verse 22 in verse uh, through 28 in the NIV. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. Okay, that's the same thing as adultery. If a man happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you should take both of them to the gate of the town and stone them to death. The young woman, because she was in a town and did not scream for help, she went along with it. She was, this is 
and the man because he violated another man's wife. You must purge evil from among you. So, talking about adultery again, verse 25. But if out in the country a man happens to meet a young woman pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the woman. She has committed no sin deserving death. This, I mean, so far, so good. This case, so uh, this is the betrothed woman, okay? The, the pledged to be married woman. This case is like that of someone who attacks a murderer's neighbor. For the man found the young woman out in the country, and though the betrothed woman screamed, there was none to rescue her. So, okay, that, that seems to be kind of a, a, the same thing that the King James Bible uh, generally said. Now look at verse number 28. So we're talking about a woman that was, that was betrothed, that was pledged to be married, that, got, that was raped, okay? And verse 25 through 27 matches up with the King James Bible's punishment. Now look at verse 28. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married. So here's a woman who's not engaged, she's not betrothed, she's not pledged to be married, and rapes her, and they are discovered. He shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman, for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as she lives, as long as he lives. Nice! I mean, the NIV hates single women, apparently. The NIV is saying that if you're betrothed and that happens to you, death. But if you're not betrothed and that happens to you, you get to marry the guy. Who in the world would believe a religion that teaches that? Who in the world would follow a religion, I don't care what religion it is, that teaches that a woman has to marry the person who assaulted her in that way? That's what the NIV teaches. It, 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 first of all, it contradicts itself one verse later. The, the Bible is, the, the NIV literally contradicts its own philosophy one verse later. It's not like you have to search through the NIV to find a contradiction. It contradicts itself like in one verse. I mean, as if being married or not makes a difference to justice for a rape. It makes no sense, folks. The, I mean, the NIV hates single ladies, apparently. But you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to discredit the word of God. It's trying to discredit the pure words of the Lord is what this is happening. Because somebody hears that, somebody would hear that and they'd be like, ugh. Right away your conscience is just like, that's not right. I mean, you don't have to be like, you could tell anybody. You go out anywhere, you don't have to be saved. You just like, how, anyone that has the law written in their heart that's not just a total wicked evil person would just completely be like, just repulsed by that. They're discrediting the Bible. And we, look, we run into these people all the time. These people that say, oh, the, you know, the Bible justifies slavery. You know, the Bible justifies, you know, you know rape, and you have to marry your rapist. Pfft. Not the King James Bible. Your false Bible does. The NIV does exactly that. Here's another thing. Here's the third one. The NIV justifies divorce. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew chapter 19. So now that, we, now that we've talked about betrothal and what betrothal meant, um, we need to kind of do a study on marriage and what the Bible teaches about marriage. Let's look at what the Bible teaches about marriage and divorce um, real quickly. Look at Matthew chapter 19 and look at verse number 9. The Bible says, and I say unto you, whosoever, you've got to keep your place in Deuteronomy chapter 22. I'm sorry, I should have told you that. Keep your place in Deuteronomy 22 and let's look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 9 says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, that means divorce his wife, except it be for what? For fornication. And shall marry another, committeth adultery. First of all, fornication and adultery are not the same thing. Fornication is something, is, is a, is a uh, uh, sin of, of lying with someone who's not your wife, you know, and you're not married. Adultery is when you're married and you lie with someone other than your, your spouse, okay? Look at, it says, So whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her with which put away, committeth adultery. So the Bible here is saying that you can't get divorced unless it's a reason for a fornication. And I'll get to that in a minute. But then it's saying, when you get divorced, you can't be remarried. Okay, and look, if anybody's been divorced, I mean, you're supposed to, you know, do you stay married to who you're married to now? This doesn't mean, you know, get divorced again and try to go back to, you know, no. Okay? The Bible is just saying that, you know, if you get divorced, you are to stay single. 
Okay? And the only, the only God-justified reason for divorce is fornication. It doesn't say adultery. Okay? It's fornication. I mean, you've got to keep in mind that, you know, in God's law, the adulterers would be dead. So that wouldn't really be an issue. Okay? You've got to kind of remember that. Okay? But look, the Bible says, except for it be for fornication. You're just like, okay, well, how could that be possible? The reason it could be possible is exactly what happened. Well, actually, if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 22, this is what it's talking about. All right? Remember the betrothal period. Remember the betrothal period where you're promised to be married. All right? Now look at verse 13 of Deuteronomy chapter 22. The Bible says, If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her. So here's a man that takes a wife. They were betrothed. They got married. And they went to consummate the marriage, they came together physically, and he has a problem with her. He's like upset, right? And give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her. And look, it, it explains to you what his problem is right here. And say, I took this woman when I came to her and I found her not a maid. The Bible is saying that he was betrothed to a woman, he got married to her, and you know, he thought that she was a virgin. Look, both are supposed to be virgins when they get married. That is what the Bible teaches. Okay, and he found that she was not, okay, and he accuses her of that. Then verse 15, the, the Bible says, Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate. And I'm not going to get into that. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So basically, there, there's, a, there's a judgment. Is he, is he right or is he not right? Okay. And the elders of the city shall take that man and chastise him if he was wrong. If he was falsely accusing her, he's in trouble. And then if she was actually not a maid, then you know, she is stoned. Okay. So fornication is serious, first of all, in the Old Testament. So what was the reason that he was able to put her away in this case if she was not a maid, not a virgin. It was because she had fornicated before they were married. It's because she misrepresented that she was pure when she went to be married. So this in Matthew chapter 1, go ahead to Matthew chapter 1, this was what Joseph was assuming about Mary when she was pregnant because Joseph and Mary were in that betrothal stage. They had not come together as man or wife and of course she's found with child. So it's like Hello, you know, he's, he's like, this is a problem. Okay, but look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. This is the fornication that the Bible is saying, is that there was fornication before the marriage. Look at verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 1, was on this wise. When as his mother was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. We know that the child was of the Holy Ghost, not from some person or, or another man. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, okay, this means he's a, he's a good man, he's trying to do the right thing, and not, wanting to, not willing to make her a public example. Look, he could have made her a public example. Was minded to put her away privily. He was, his first thought was to just privately divorce her. That was his thought at this time. Okay, remember, they're under Roman rule. They're not under the Old Testament law, okay? But he was just, you know, he was going to put her away quietly. He didn't want to make a public example of Mary. He's just like, wh why was he able to put her away, though? He was a just man, and he was going to put her away because of fornication. Because he's like, she was fornicating, and she's pregnant now. Right? This is what he was assuming. But while he thought on these things, look at verse 20. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, she shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So the angel comes and explains to Joseph what happened, and we know the story from there. But the point is this. There's two points, okay? There's no modern equivalent of espousal. Uh, here, here's, the, here's the reason that there's no, there's, no real, there's no biblical justification for divorce today. I'm going to explain Because there is no espousal period today where you're considered married, and, you know, there's, there could be fornication in that time. You know, it was considered the same as marriage. I mean, it, that's a little different from this, you know, engagement or whatever that means nothing today. It's, it's not considered marriage by any stretch of the imagination in the United States especially. Okay, so there's no modern 
equivalent to this betrothal period. There's no modern equivalent that we have to it. We've replaced it with this engagement. You know, here's what happens today. Couples fornicate and live together for years and years and years. And then they get engaged for several more years, and then they never get married anyway. That's such a common thing. Okay, it's like, oh, you know, they're, they're in fornication, and then the, the, the woman's like, I want to be married. I've, I've seen that, heard this story repeated so many times. The woman wants to be married, and he's like, okay, she's going to go. He's like, well, let's get engaged, which means nothing. You're laughing because you've, you've heard that you've seen this play out as well. But the point is this. Fornication is a big deal. It's the only reason for divorce, and, and it's in that betrothal period, which doesn't apply today. So there's no equivalent for that today. There's no real reason for divorce today. All right? the, the Bible says in Malachi you know, 2.16 that God, hate, you know, God hated putting away. God hates divorce. You know, God does not want people to get divorced. Now let's look at the NIV. You say, what's all that to say this? Let's look at the NIV. Go back to Matthew chapter 19. So the Bible says in Matthew 19, 9, it says, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, now we get that, we know what that means, and shall marry another committeth adultery. Okay? Look what the Bible says. I need you to go to Matthew 19, and I need you to get ready to go to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to show you how wicked this is. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 19 and look at verse number 9 again. I'm going to read you the NIV version of verse number 9 of Matthew 19. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So the Bible here is changing fornication to sexual immorality. Now look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. You say, I don't know, what's the big deal? I'll show you the big deal. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, Jesus says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Okay, so first of all, you have to understand a couple things here. The Bible here is saying is that if a man looks at a woman and lusts after her, like, he doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to, like, he just, like, he, if, 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 if a man's on the Internet looking at pornography, he's committing adultery on his wife, is what Jesus is saying in his heart. The Bible here is saying that just looking at a woman and lusting after a woman is committing adultery. I mean, look, now, we don't believe that all sin is equal here because that's not what the King James Bible teaches. So, obviously, looking at a, uh, too long at a magazine rack at the grocery store is not the same as going committing actual adultery on your wife. I mean, those are two different levels of sin. But Jesus here is saying that you could say that looking at pornography or looking at a woman walking down the street who's walking down the street naked, which many women are today, your thighs are nakedness. Everyone's naked today walking around. The Bible says from your knees up is your nakedness. So if you're looking upon some woman's nakedness to lust after her, look, this is a man problem. This is a men, I'm, I'm specifically talking to the men here. You've got to control your eyes. That's an, it's another sermon in itself. We must control what we look at because Jesus says we're committing adultery in our hearts. And you know what? You could equate that to sexual immorality. The NIV is saying my wife could divorce me if I look at a woman on the street, which I should not do, and we should not look at things that we're not supposed to look at. But the point is, is that there have been women... Many pastors will tell you of examples of women that use this to divorce their husbands. Oh, he is looking at something he shouldn't have looked at, and, and it, it, but look, the NIV justifies that. It says sexual immorality. It says, you know, that, that's a pretty big category right there. In the King James Bible, it's, it's a category that's so small that because of betrothal, what that meant, it doesn't even apply today. It doesn't even apply today. But with just putting this umbrella of sexual immorality as a reason that you can get divorced, I mean, you wonder why so many churches are okay with divorce. It's because the Bible says it's okay. That's why. God hates divorce, he says in Malachi 2.16. He hates it. Look, here's the thing. This is another sermon in itself, too. But there is no, I do not believe that there is any no-fault divorce, meaning there is no divorce that has ever happened in the history of mankind. This is what I believe. 
And I'll preach a sermon on it that proves from the Bible, from the King James Bible, what I'm saying. There is no, because I mean, how many times have you heard somebody divorce? It's like, oh, it was, it was her. She was just this wicked person. She was doing this thing. She wasn't saved. Or he was a terrible person. He was a drunk. There is no divorce that's ever happened where one person was completely innocent. Never. I'll prove it from the Bible in another sermon. But the point is, God hates it. And there is no such thing as no fault divorce. But the NIV justifies it. If you have an NIV and you just show that to somebody, it's like, hey, he was sexually immoral. Well, that may be true. Justified divorce right there. It's a big deal, folks. Fornication is the issue which does not apply today. So look, I mean, how many more examples do you need? These are just a few examples of the NIV. It changes the gospel. It changes who Jesus was. It changes the, it changes the person of Jesus. I mean, and look, folks, it, it, it teaches terrible stupidity in the Bible that literally will turn people away from God. When we look at these wicked things that we went over, it justifies divorce. We met people just yesterday that said this. Look, just the fact that these other versions exist, aside from what they say, is enough for some people to just not believe the Bible. These two guys yesterday, they're just like, what, the Bible's the Word of God? You know, we're telling them the Bible is God's pure words. We're showing them in the Bible. They're like, how many versions of the Bible are there? Which one's the right one? Which one's the right one? Just the fact that 150 or more Bible versions exist is enough for some people to just logically not believe the Bible because they're like, which one's right? Well, we know which one's right. This one. This is why we're King James only. It justifies divorce as if, as if a society that has a close to 75% divorce rate, depending on how you look at it, needs more justification for a divorce. I mean, divorce is a major destructive force in our, in our society today. It destroys families. It destroys children. It pulls people from the Word of God. But here's the thing. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1. We'll end it here. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1. These attacks, these attacks are very subtle. These changes of words are very subtle. You know, maybe not the divorce one and maybe not the rape one, but these attacks on the gospel are very subtle. They very subtly twist who Jesus was. They very subtly add works to the gospel. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1. Anything that's subtle is bad. Subtle means sneaky. Subtle means behind the back. It's not up front. That's why if you have a problem with somebody in the church, you're supposed to just go to that person and just like, just say, hey man, you offended me. Matthew 18. Hey man, what you said yesterday, I, I was offended by that. I mean, say it in a nice way. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. You know what's subtle? Going behind their back and be like, yeah, you know, this, I think, That's subtlety. And Satan is the subtle one. Satan is always, you know, the subtlety is always bad. Look at verse number 1 of Genesis chapter 3. Look what the Bible says. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said, this is Satan using the serpent, talking through the serpent. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, it's, it's always been Satan's job to get you to doubt, to get people to doubt the Word of God. It's always been Satan's job to find those two guys that we met yesterday and, and, and do these different things with these Bible verses and get them to doubt whether God's Word is true. He did it from the beginning. He didn't say, he didn't say, hey, God really said this. No, he said, did he really say it that way? Did he really say that? Just trying to plant that seed of doubt in her. It, did it not work? Did it not work? Look, folks, Ecclesiastes 1 tells us that there is no new thing under the sun. There is no new thing under the sun. You need to warn people about this Bible version. If you have people that you love in your family, obviously we need to get them the gospel, we need to get them saved, but they need to be reading a Bible that is the Word of God. They need to throw the, I mean, we need to, they need to burn this heresy that is the NIV. It's not a small thing. You know, when we say, oh, we're King James only, it's not just, it, that doesn't mean we're old-fashioned. That's not what that means. Well, I mean, it does, but it means that we know what the pure words of God are, and we are not going to compromise on the pure words of God. 
I, I don't know. I mean, do you understand now why so many people that are not King James only are preaching a false gospel? Do you understand that? Because that's what their Bible says. That's what their Bible literally says. It's, it's God just changing the Word of God. It, look, Satan's job is to get us to doubt the Word of God, to pe get people to not believe the Word of God, to get people to think that it's stupid, that it's wicked, that it's evil. Because look, it, that's some wicked, evil stuff that we're reading about there. So they don't believe it, and they end up in hell. That's it. That's Satan's goal. It's always been his goal, and he does it by changing what God says. That's why God put in Revelation 22, anybody that adds to or removes from, he's saying anybody that changes what I said, he's like, they're damned. It's a big deal, folks. We will always be King James only because God's words are pure. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.